host for this webinar. I know that today's topic might bring up a number of questions from you. So you may type your questions in chat box and I want to let you know that we will address as many as we can in the time we have today. And I welcome and request our NBMS National Webinar Coordinator, Professor Dr. Somashekhar to start this session. Welcome, sir. Over to you. Thank you very much, Navneet Singh Ji. Uh, dear trainees, you know that now practical exams are over. You're expecting result now. Uh, so which means we shifted gears and from case presentation, I have actually moved back to blocks of topic discussion, which are very, very relevant to surgical oncology. I know myself being a surgical oncologist as a student, which are your weak spots. Euro onco, ortho onco, gyne onco, and to some extent, head and neck are the very weak spot during your training in surgical onco. They themselves are extremely very big, vast, dedicated subspecialty branches. You have to make an extra effort to learn them. That's why now this next one to two months, I have decided that I'm going to cover these topics which are not well versed. Concepts are not clear. So this is now full Euro onco month and week. I've decided I'm going to fresh everything and bring the best of the best experts in India in this field. So rightly, today we have very senior Euro onco and uh, you know robotic uh, specialist, Dr. Saurabh Vashist, extremely well trained, very well trained uh, from you know SGPGI, trained in Rajiv Gandhi and uh, you know taking care of Euro onco and robotic a team in Manipal Cancer Center and across the Manipal cluster. More than that, more than being a good surgeon and a good human being, very well-read person, always interested to know all the new trials and he translates into its management to the patient. So, you know, no better person that came to my mind when I had this Euro-Onco topic other than Dr. Saurabh Vashist. Thank you very much, Saurabh, for accepting. I know you are in a Euro-Onco Congress. Mm -hmm. And you're squeezing your time, and uh, but you no know, for nothing uh, for the benefit of students. Uh, this goes a long way in taking the blessings and uh, of DNB board and uh, you know on the students. Thank you very much. And students, at the end of the talk, please put your doubts, whatever you are, how much silly you may think. Please remember, they're not silly. You will not get the expert again and again like this. So put it in chat box or Q and A, and Dr. Saurabh Bhushan will answer as much as possible in the given time. Thank you. Welcome, Saurabh, and over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, good morning to everybody. And at the outset, I would like to thank National Board of Examination and Som Shikhar, sir, to give me this opportunity. And I will try my level best to justify uh, what this one hour session to clarify all the queries of the students. So, first of all, whenever we are thinking about any disease, we should first understand when and how to suspect about the bladder cancer. So, whenever anybody who is coming with painless gross hematuria, Persistent microhematuria, persistent refractory and storage symptoms like frequency, urgency, and with the in the in the in the light of the history of smoking or tobacco, radiation therapy to the pelvis, long-standing UTI, stones, PUC, uh, patients who are on long-standing OHA, patients who are elderly patients who are having a history of artificial sweetener for a long time, especially sacrine. Nowadays, it is discontinued, but yes, in elderly patient, you may have this kind of history. And if there is a history of cystitis, cystica, glandularis, schistosomias, or any other pelvic organ malignancy, and if there is a chemical exposure like fertilizer, in those conditions, we should have a very high suspicion and our threshold for evaluation to rule out the bladder cancer should be very low. In, in investigation, if you are finding any focal UV wall thickening on ultrasound, it should always be further evaluated to rule out the possibility of malignancy. So, what all to be seen in history, general history, you have to take a history of loss of weight, loss of appetite, cough, recent onset of exoskeleton pain. It is a very important point. Any pain, if somebody is complaining of pain in joints or knee or elbows, it is not so safe given. But if any elderly patient coming up with this history and giving a history of recent onset of axial skeletal pain, it should be very well evaluated and it, a possibility of skeletal metastasis should be ruled out. If there is an unexplained voiding or storage bloods, hematuria, is there a history of, is there any history of a stricture or urethral procedure? Because this is very important. Whenever you are planning for the procedure, uh, bladder tumor management, this has to be very well ruled out because if the patient is having a stricture or previous history of urethral procedure, in such patients, 
we will like to avoid and offer them orthotopic neo bladder and we like to tell them to go for the ileal conduits because if there is any bladder outlet obstruction or distal obstruction it will be very difficult for the patient to manage ONB in the future if there is any feature suggestive of renal failure history of because if there is a features of renal failure we will not be able to give the adequate outcome to the patient and first of all we should decompress the system and try to optimize the renal function is there any history of smoking tobacco or chemical exposure in examination we have to just see pallor ictus specifically left supraclavicular lymph nodes inguinal lymph nodes are very important to see in these patient because inguinal lymph nodes are non regional implants in ca bladder and they constitutes the metastatic disease and if there is any lower limb swelling which suggestive of either the lymph node or the pelvic uh, compression over the veins and in that condition most likely we are dealing with a locally advanced tumor and first of all we should try to uh, manage the patient with the new adjuvant chemotherapy is there any palpable renal mass in extra genitalia we have to see the meatus phimosis and bxo like changes because as i have explained to you these things may preclude for future offer of orthotopic neo bladder and never forget to do digital rectal examination because in 5 to 10% of cases we may have a simultaneous ca prostate as well as ca bladder and if we are not aware about this fact it will be very difficult for us to manage uh, in the future for the ca prostate the evaluation evaluation there are some basic evaluation whenever we are having a high suspicion we should first of all do the urine routine microscopy in urine routine microscopy the most important things to be seen is the rbcs so usual number is saying that 0 to 3 is the normal and if anything above is should be considered as an abnormal whenever we are evaluating the rbc we should uh, also try to rule out the possibility of dysmorphic rbcs because if there is a dysmorphic rbc it is most likely a glomerular disease not a renal uh, uh, pcs system problem we have to get one serum creatinine to look for the future planning of the ct or mri uh, ultrasound kub with pfr you should always get a uroflow also done because sometime if the patient is having poor flow or subclinical uh, bph or outlet obstruction there are cases when after the trbt they the symptom precipitated and patient went into the retention and they become very annoyed that why it has happened so it is always better to evaluate the patient from that aspect also to avoid any un unwarranted uh, com complications in the post op and psa should be done if there is any if the patient is above 50 or abnormal dre now the urine cytology is a very important point because it's a very sensitive tool for identifying the high grade tumors or cis but the problem is this that urine cytology should not be offered in cases of gross or microscopic hematuria because the presence of rbc is will going to uh, create a confusion in the assessment of the malignant cells and this urine cytology should always be done in the fresh samples and because sometimes the yields is very less so ideally 3 to 5 samples should be done to identify it so as far as the metastatic workup is there there should be a detailed renal function test liver function test x ray chest serum calcium albumin protein then the contrast ct abdomen and pelvis or mri depending upon the renal function and the requirement bone scan and pet ct should be offered only if there are equivocal uh, finding in ct or mri or if there is an unexplained high alkaline phosphatase or bony pain otherwise usually if the ct abdomen and pelvis has been done the patient should not be offered bone scan or pet ct ct head and thorax should also be done only in cases of organ specific symptoms like unexplained cuff or some focal neurological deficits or if there is any gross abnormality on the x ray chest otherwise if it is not then there is no need to go for the ct thorax now the urine cytology as i have explained to you urine cytology is a very important tool because it is very sensitive it's a very high sensitivity and specificity for high grade lesion and cis so it become very important if the patient is having unexplained positive cytology but on ultra ct and endoscopy we are not able to identify any specific reason for that patient should be always evaluated for the upper tract net to rule out the upper tract malignancy now the what is the ideal way of reporting this urine, urine cytology it should be reported as pare system which is says that no adequate diagnosis possible that means no diagnosis negative 
atypia suspicion or malignant other than that the urine cytology should not be reported by any other method because it will going to create confusion and it will not be the ideal answer for the further management now is there any other tumor markers available yes there are few tumor markers there are few tumor markers for screening of the bladder cancer which is fgfr3 nmp22 and eurovision but uh, they are usually are uh, over sensitive and less specific so they are not as good as it should be for follow up and to detect the recurrence there is no other tumor marker available other than the cystoscopy the the future uh, the idea behind developing these tumor markers so that we can replace the cystoscopy in future but till now because of the lower sensitivity specificity no other tumor no tumor marker is possible which can replace cystoscopy there are few tumor markers new tumor markers are uh, coming up which is cx bladder adx bladder and explored bell bladder which are identified to the high grade recurrences and uh, occurring in low or intermediate no uh, non muscle invasive bladder tumor because of their high sensitivity and negative pre uh, predictive value but none of these things are recommended in any of the guidelines and they are not been widely tested by any of the rcts so uh, when when you have confirmed or when you have a very high suspicion of malignancy then we have to go proceed for the imaging so there is no role of plain ct or mri in 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 management of bladder tumor unless it the uh, the contrast ct or mri is absolutely contraindicated contrast ct abdomen and pelvis is mainly done for the regional or distant metastasis and to look forward the upper tract and assessment of the primary tumor size and extent they are to be seen if the, the cct should be offered in all patients if we are dealing with focal unexplained focal bladder wall thickening multiple tumors recurrent masses size if size is more than 2 to 3 cm if ultrasound is showing hydronephrosis or hydrotenephrosis and specifically if the ultrasound has been done at some outside uh, the hospital at a low volume center because being an operator dependent investigation there are 20 to 30% of possibility of missing some important points and uh, later on doing an ct after the turbt will not be able to give us the appropriate information now about the contrast mri usually contrast mri has been developed for the purpose of local staging for assessing the tumor wall uh, the thickness or the invasion of the in the bladder which is being uh, uh, which is being derived uh, explained by viride scoring so the contrast mri should be done only if the creatinine is above 1.5 but it should not be more than 2.25 3 because if the gfr is less than 30 then it can lead to a very uh, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis which is an un, uh, irreversible damage and there is no treatment available now ideally there is no role of pet ct or pet mri in the initial assessment because of the two reason number one uh, the it is uh, uh, because the the fdg dye is being excreted in the urine so it will be difficult to assess uh, to comment over the uh, lesion in presence of the fdg in the urine but yes this pet ct and pet mri can be offered in those cases where the findings are equivocal or if we want to do the assessment of the treatment response or after the treatment otherwise ideally in uh, pet ct and mri should not be offered there are few newer things available which is known as contrast ultrasound usually it is done offered in cases when the contrast ct and mri is not possible or contraindicated and we want to comment over the vascularity and to rule out the possibility to differentiate between the benign and the malignant tissue there is another technique which is known as endoscopic ultrasound it is again basically it's a very sensitive tool to assess the bladder wall thickness but un because unfortunately the gold standard is still the biopsy so it's very difficult to replace such things by the biopsy now about the tnm staging when we have identified the tumor and you have done the imaging and the metastatic workup you will like to classify the tumor in the tnm staging so it is the the ta is non invasive that means that the tumor is confined to the mucosa only ta tis is carcinoma in c2 t1 is invasion to the lamina propria now in the recent few studies have also shown that they will like to further differentiate t1 into the t1 a and t1 b in terms of superficial lamina invasion and deep mass lamina invasion 
because it will going to differentiate between the high risk and low risk groups. So they have identified that those who are having superficial lamina invasion should be considered as a low or intermediate risk group and there the still intravesical chemotherapy should be offered. But if it is a deep lamina invasion that is T1B in these patients are usually high risk patient and they should be offered an early cystic chemo. And T2 is the muscle invasion A and superficial and deep. T3 is perivesical in which T4 is tumor into the A, into the prostate stroma, seminal vesicle and adjacent structure and T4B is the up to the pelvic wall. Lymph node is N1 is a single lymph node in the true pelvis, N2 is multiple lymph nodes and N3 is common iliac and M1 and MB is non-regional and distant meds. In this, one important point is to differentiate between T3A and T3B. Usually, it is being differentiated by the bimanual examination prior to the resection and after the resection. If we are able to palpate a tumor bimanually even after the resection, most likely we are dealing with a macroscopically extravesical disease, which is T3B. It is very important point because if you are getting a biopsy from outside, which is showing that either the muscle is not that muscle is not invasive, muscle invasion is not present in the biopsy. But if in the OT notes it is written that the patient tumor was bimanually palpable or even after the resection it was palpable, most likely it is a wrong uh, histopathological diagnosis. And in such patients, you should always try to review the biopsy or to do the repeat resection because most likely the patient is having muscle invasion or extravesical disease. Now, about the pathology, in the patho initially, since 1973 to 2004, tumors were usually defined as G grade 1, grade 2 and grade 3. In, 2000, uh, in 2004, WHO has revised the criteria and they have come up with a new terminology which is known as PANLAP, non-invasive and invasive papillary carcinoma along with low grade and high grade. But because this was not uh, uh, considering the importance of the lymphovascular invasion. So again in 2022, WHO has come up with a revised criteria where they have considered the LVI also and in that they have reclassified it to be like low grade, G1 low grade and low grade considered of grade 1 and grade 2 with the, which are having no lymphovascular invasion. On the contrary, they have defined as high grade as grade 2 which are having lymphovascular invasion and grade 3 which has been described previously. Now, how the ideal TRBT histopathological reporting should be done? So, once we have gone inside, we have resected the tumor, what all it should constitute? It should, it should be able to tell whether we are dealing with malignant or benign pathology. It should be able to uh, give us information about type of malignancy, grade, lamina and muscle invasion and specifically if possible then the depth of the invasion the lymphovascular invasion, micropapillary variant, dysplasias, metaplasias, small cell variant and any other positive finding. Among all these points, very important point is this micropapillary variant because the presence of micropapillary variant even in cases of non-muscle invasive tumor is a very valid indication of offering the radical cystectomy. So we should always ask our pathologist to comment over micropapillary variant in the biopsy. Now, is there any role of review of biopsy? Yes, because the histopathological examination is an operator dependent uh, technique and there can be a variation in the intra observer and inter observer variation. And it has been found that there can be a possibility of 50 to 60 percent changes in the up staging or low staging of the final histopathology examination. So, whenever we are dealing with uh, biopsies which has been done outside the center should always be reviewed because it has been found that the, uh, uh, the re biopsy evaluation done at a high volume centers will going to change the diagnosis or staging of the disease. So currently what are the different type of urothelial carcinoma? It's, it's a plain urothelial carcinoma, urothelial carcinoma with ischiomas or glandular or trophoblastic differentiation, micropapillary variant, nested variant, plasmocytocyte, lymphoepithelial, small cell, sarcomatoid, adenocarcinomas, and so on. So, this is are the different uh, guidelines as per the EUA, what the should be done. So, they say that very well that the tumor should be tried to be classified as TNM staging, very strong evidence and we should not try to use the term superficial bladder tumor. So, ideally it should be non-muscle invasive 
or invasive or non-invasive. There is no terminology like superficial. Because ideally, if the tumor is lamina invasive, then also initially it was classified as a superficial. But nowadays, there is no such terminology should be used and it should be de described as either invasive or non-invasive. So now, whenever we are dealing with any... Uh, bladder mass or suspicion of bladder mass we have to be we have to go inside because that is the ultimate answer for this so there are uh, cystoscopies available so the one is the conventional white light cystoscopy but it has been identified that uh, the flat lesions can be missed up to 30 percent cases only with the white light so there is a new technology has come up which is known as narrow band imaging in which instead of using the conventional light we are using a blue light which is from the 450 to 550 nanometer and it is being uh, specifically taken up by the uh, lesions which is hypervascular and uh, they are able to give us uh, additional 30 percent yield of uh, detection of the malignant uh, lesions especially the flat lesion but the problem with the narrow band imaging is that it is highly sensitive so it can be false positive in cases of inflammation cystitis and specifically post BCG or post mitomycin installation but uh, <clears throat> now another is the uh, PDCP cystoscopy in which the 5 uh, HLA or 5 ALA uh, dye is being given which are specifically taken up by the hypervascular tissue and the cystoscopy is done the white, in the blue light and it also increases the uh, the chances of uh, a better detection of the flat lesion it is high highly sensitive and there is in uh, the the cord co concurrence is there with the biopsy level up to 93% it has a lower specificity than white light and there is a possibility of false positivity as i have explained to you in cases of initial inflammation and trbt it, it definitely reduces the recurrence and progression but the problem is with this is that, that we have to give the first the dye and then we have to D and it requires a specific, uh, uh, the, it, it, it causes a little more OR time. And I think the NBI is little better than the PDCP. Now, there are a few newer technology about the uh, this. One is confocal laser microendoscopy. It will going to give you a microscopic image by the laser method, which will going to give us about the depth in vision. But again, it has not been compared head to head with in any of the RCT trials. So they are still in a uh, in a in a developmental phase only. So this is again some guidelines which has to be done. Like CTI view has to be done in the workup of hematuria, and uh, cytoscopy cystoscopy should be done. Flexible cystoscopy should be done, and the tumor should be tried to. Uh, 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 Describe as per the bladder diagram, which I will going to show you later on. So now, whenever we are doing a TORBT, so basically, what are the things which I have to do? So there are multiple methods of doing any tumor resection. They are the gold standard and the uh, and the, the most common is monopolar. But uh, there are instances when we, they have identified that they, especially if the tumor in the lateral wall, there can be a chances of obturator jerk. So to avoid that, people have come up with the idea of doing TORBT with the bipolar current. They have come up with the idea with the, using it by the laser, which can be other holmium laser and thulmium laser. Now, there is a, in, in the most common uh, uh, problem with the TORBT is this, that here it is the only oncological surgery where you are t removing the tumor in the piecemeal and in, 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 in everywhere whenever we are dealing with the tumor we try to remove the tumor in and block without cutting it in between but this is the only surgery where we, do, uh, we are doing it in piecemeal so people have uh, raised an objection and they were having concern that it can lead to implantation of malignant cells and it can change the tissue architecture and we, uh, the treatment can be changed. So they have come up with the idea of end block resection. End block resection is basically having an advantage that uh, the, the tumor is being cut with the base. So the yield of the muscle, muscle in the biopsy will be more. It is less uh, bleeding is there, but the, the learning curve is more and there are very high chances of having perforation if it has not been done appropriately. Now, people have come up with the idea to, to decrease the learning curve of N-block uh, TORBT. They have come up with the idea of cold cutting scissors and snares, but they are still in the developmental phase and not has been established by any of the guidelines. 
Now, how to assess whether the TRBT has been done? It's a good quality TRBT or not. So, the presence of detrusor muscle in the specimen is considered as a surrogate criteria for good resection. If there is no muscle present, then it should not be considered as a good uh, TRBT. Absence of detrusor muscle in the specimen associated with significant higher risk of residual disease early recurrence and tumor under staging. So whenever we are not able to identify the muscle, patient will should always be offered a re-TURBT or staging TURBT, even though if the CT or MRI or endoscopy or biopsy also is showing no evidence of uh, growth or abnormality in the bladder. Now, how, uh, how, how, how the tumor should be defined in biopsy? It should be defined as a bladder diagram to avoid any uh, any 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 sort of confusion or uh, to standardize it so it should be done in a systematic manner which should be uh, uh, the tumor should be the, uh, the marked in this diagram because it will not only going to help you how to make the plan but it will also going to give us you an idea that from in the in the future where the recurrence is this because if the patient is having a recurrence on the same side most likely and early recurrence most likely it is not a recurrence it was a residual disease which has been missed during the previous resection on the contrary if the patient is having uh, multiple recurrences at a different site that means we are dealing with a multifocal disease and these patients should be considered as a high risk patient and should be offered a early cystectomy rather than managing with the bladder protocol preservation protocol so, is there any role of random bladder biopsy? Yes, the random bladder biopsy should be done only in cases when the patient is having persistent positive urine cytology, but the white light as well as narrow band or blue light cystoscopy is consistently negative. Otherwise, usually random biopsies are not indicated. Is there any role of prostatic biopsy? Yes. If there is any high chances or possibility if the tumor is very in the in the prostatic urethra or if the tumor is very in the near the bladder neck, in such cases, we should always try to take a prostatic urethral biopsy because this will going to change the staging and future plan of the uh, bladder cancer. Now, when to consider for the second resection? So, so, first of all, we have to understand that why we should consider the second resection. So, whenever the patient is coming up with you, with which is having any high-grade lesion, or if the muscle is absent, then it has been identified that there is a 30 to 35 percent possibility that if we will going to do the second resection, there is a possibility of upstaging of the tumor. So, all the patients who are having with the high-grade lesions. Those who are having lamina invasive disease, even though if the muscle is present but negative, should be always offered a uh, second resection. Second resection can be avoided only in cases when the patient is a case candidate for the new adjuvant chemotherapy or if the patient is a candidate for early cystectomy. Otherwise, in all cases with high-grade lesions, lamina invasive disease with and without muscle present and if in all the cases where the muscle is absent should always be offered second resection so uh, when it should be offered it should be done only in cases of uh, only after two to six weeks of initial resection because initially there will be the so much of inflammation will be there that uh, usually the bleeding will be intractable and it will be very difficult and very high chances of having perforation so, is it going to impact uh, uh, the outcome? Yes, it will definitely going to have a positive impact on recurrence-free survival, progression-free survival and overall survival. But it has been identified only in cases when the detrusor muscle was absent in the initial rese resection. So, these are the again guidelines, how to do it, how to, when to do the prostatic biopsy, when to do the random biopsy, how to resect the tumor and all those. These all are all from the EUA 2022. So, now, if the, once the tumor has been identified, definitely patient as well as the doctor, the treating physician will like to understand that what is the possibility of disease recurrence and progression. So, there are few uh, 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 scoring system available on the net by which we can try to uh, predict this uh, the possibility of future recurrence and progression and depending upon that we can plan our future treatment There's usually they are being devised as uh, 2006 EORTC criteria and CUETO criteria especially in those cases which are BCG treated and uh, EUA 2021 scoring model 
So this is the risk stratification. So it, usually there are three risk factors available. Age is more than 70, multiple city of the tumor and the tumor diameter is more than three. This is the 2022. In, uh, before that, it was very simple to remember. So usually how I remember. So any tumor which is low grade, less than three centimeter, first tumor, and uh, uh, primary tumor, single tumor, low grade, less than 3 cm and without CIS are considered as a low grade tumor. On the contrary, opposite to that, any tumor which is secondary tumor, that means recurrent tumor, multiple, any high grade lesion, more than 3 cm or are considered as a high grade lesion. Anything which is not coming up in between should be considered as an intermediate group. And there is a fourth category which is known as very high risk category where there is a com possibility of combination of the cases in, in high risk. That means multiple, multiple and recurrent tumor, multiple uh, high grade tumor, multiple tumor or, uh, or the, uh, the, the tumor more than 3 cm with CIS. So these are the tumor cases which should be defined as a very high risk category. And these are the patients where we should have a low cystectomy and should be offered a early cystectomy in such patients. Nowadays, it has been defined as uh, in a high risk patient, all T1 and high grade lesions without CIS, except those included in very high risk group. And in the other group, very high risk, where there are permutation combination of various risk factors. So now, whenever we have done the resection, so there are there is always a concern that we are doing a piecemeal resection, so the tumor cells will going to be uh, can there is a possibility of implantation of the tumor cells, which can lead to the uh, recurrence, or there can be a viable tumor cells, which can lead to the recurrence. So there is a concept has come to kill those tumor cells, and for that there was an option of doing some intravesical drug installation. So there are multiple various options are available. The gold standard is mitomycin, but nowadays people have come up with the, uh, with the installation of gemcitabine also in the power operative period. So usually how it is being done, it is being done by two methods in intraoperative. Intraoperative method only mitomycin or gemcitabine should be considered. So usually 40 milligram mitomycin is instilled in 50 cc of distilled water and it should be kept inside the bladder for minimum 45 minutes to one hour. We should avoid putting mitomycin if there is an frank perforation, if there is a deep resection, if there is a possibility of residual tumor or if there is a high possibility of muscle invasive tumor, if you are dealing with a locally advanced tumor or if you have done the large area of resection when the tumor bulk was more because and active hematuria because all these things may lead to systemic absorption of the mitomycin or the seepage of the mitomycin in the two pelvic cavity and which can lead to intense inflammation and fibrosis and can lead to debilitating conditions. Now, one very important thing whenever we are planning for mitomycin installation, we should always try to avoid giving Lasix at the end of the procedure because that will going to cause diuresis and once the bladder will be clamped, uh, for the, you, the PUC will be clamped for retaining the mitomycin the patient will going to have over distension of the bladder and if it has been done under spinal anesthesia, patient can have perforation or if it is being done under general anesthesia, patient will going to have pain and we may have to eventually declamp the catheter and it can lead to decrease uh, effectivity of the medication. Whenever we are considering this, it should always be documented that at what time it has been installed at the time of installation whether there, there was any abdominal distension was there or not whether there was any hematuria or not and whenever it is being declamped it should always be monitored that what was the effluent has come what was the color and what was the amount if any time you feel that the color is dark or the effluent amount is less you should have a high possibility or suspicion of perforation and you should look after the patient accordingly in the post-operative period, uh, there are multiple options. The most common is mitomycin, but uh, other is BCG. So usually we say that in the low risk patient, single installation of 40 milligram mitomycin is enough. In intermediate risk group, there are two possibilities. One is uh, either we should give the induction followed by maintenance of BCG for, for minimum one year or else there are few studies where they have tried to uh, 
give suggestion of giving intravesical myxomycin monthly basis up to one year, but there is no recommendation available in any of the guidelines. In high risk patient, uh, ideally they should be offered BCG because BCG not only decreases the chances of recurrence, but it also decreases the chances of pro progression. If BCG is not available or BCG is not well tolerated, it can be replaced by either Pyvac or gem gemcitabine or uh, cisplatin or even uh, newer medication. But if in cases in cases of high risk, the BCG should be given at least for maintenance of three years. Now, is there any other options with by which we can increase the efficacy of intravesical chemotherapy? Yes, we can do. It, it can be done by uh, adjustment of the pH. It has been found that in alkaline pH, the mitomycin is more effective. So, patient has been given option of giving soda bicarb. The duration of the installation. So, if the duration of the installation is more, it will be more effective. If it is diluted less, there are certain methods by which we can increase the effectivity by device assisted. That is microwave induction, hypothermia. High vac, hyperthermic intravesical chemotherapy, and electromotive drug administrations. Apart from all these things, only high vac is widely available, and it is available at few centers in India also. And it is it has been found equally effective in those patients who are a candidate of BCG, but where it cannot be offered either because of the unavailability or because of uh, some uh, reasons due to the BCG uh, related complications. Now to so, to, in cases of intermediate or high risk, whenever we are giving BCG, so the BCG has been uh, given, uh, BCG protocol has been given by the SWOC trial. It has been initially started with, there were uh, articles with 80 milligram and 120 milligram. But I think it is not the milligram of the medication, it is the, it is the CFU which is important. And initially it was 80 milligram and still we were containing the 80 milligram. But recently, uh, recently it has been the Oncovac is being taken up by the Sun Pharma and they have increased the concentration. So the same amount of 1 to 19 into 10 raised to the power 8 CFUs are available in 40 milligram BCG only. So in the initial trial also the uh, the BCG, uh, the CFU was between from 9, 1 to 19 into 10 raised to the power 8. So, we have to concentrate over the CFUs, not the milligrams. So, initially when this BCG was being produced by the, uh, uh, the Chennai-based company, at that time the concentration was less. So, that, that is why the 80 milligram BCG was the ideal doses. But now they have increased the concentration. So, the, now it has become the 40 milligram. So, if 80 milligram, it is not the under doses. It is the optimum dose and I think that is the reason why few people have found that the BCG is less well tolerated in Indian patients because actually we were giving the double doses of the BCG and that is why there are more chances of toxicity. Recently, I have also changed my practice of giving 40 milligram based on this CFU and I find that it is better tolerated and there are very less side effect and complication and dropout rates after this. So, usually it is being done as an induction followed by maintenance. Induction should be given weekly for first six weeks before giving usually it should be given only after two to three weeks of uh, TURBT it should not be given in, pre in presence of hematuria and the maintenance has to be given again at a three weekly uh, weekly for three weeks at 3, 6, 12, 18, 24, 30 and 36 months of the last biopsy proven so total doses should be <coughs> around 27 doses should be given so ideally it should be given for minimum three three years but minimum for one year is important and if anything which has been given less than one year should be considered as an incomplete treatment. It has to be given only after two to three weeks of TRBT, febrile UTI, gross hematuria, traumatic catheterization, they are the absolute contraindication of BCG. However, microscopic hematuria and pyuria are the relative contraindication. <laughs> So, these are the complications related with the BC intravesical BCG. So, they can be right, starting from simple cystitis, which should be, if the, it is less, less problematic, then should be managed by symptomatic treatment with anti-inflammatory and uh, local anesthetic and anticholinergic. 
and usually the bcg installation should not be postponed however in cases of if it is the symptoms are worse it can be postponed patient should be evaluated for by urine culture treated with antibiotics and other issues if there is hematuria it's an absolute no to putting the bcg if there is a system symptomatic granulomatous prostatitis it should be stopped and the patient should be <coughs> given treated with the isoniazid and rifampicin if there is an epididymitis again it should it is a valid indication of stopping the intravesical therapy and should be managed and rarely even orchidectomy can have, has to be also done now <clears throat> what are the systemic side effects systemic side effects can be general malaise and fever arthralgia and arthritis these are the conditions where usually the bcg should not be discontinued they should be continued and patient should be treated however in cases of persistent high grade fever or bcg or the changes there should be in this patient should be very well evaluated and treated with antimicrobial therapies and if required patient should uh, going to be should be having a very low threshold of starting uh, att also and in these cases bcg should not be given again now there are certain conditions and terminology in the past which has been defined by like bcg refractory tumor so how so if any uh, lamina invasive high grade tumor is present at 3 months of the treatment should be considered as a bcg refractory if any lamina uh, non invasive high grade tumor is present after 3 months or 6 month or after the reinduction of the first course should be considered as a refractory tumor and if cis is present at 3 month and it also persists at 6 month so here we have to see that if there is a non lamina invasive high grade lesion or cis is present at first 3 months should not be considered as a refractory or failure and the uh, and the, the bcg should be continued and patient should be reevaluated at 6 month and if there is a presence of abnormal uh, presence of Uh, lamina non lamina invasive uh, superficial non lamina invasive high grade tumor and cis even at 6 month then these patient should be termed as bcg refractory and if high grade tumor appear during bcg maintenance therapy then should be considered as bcg refractory now what is bcg relapsing bcg relapsing when the patient has completed the full bcg maintenance and has been uh, and has been uh, documented that there is no evidence of malignancy and later on in the follow up patient has been found to have malign recurrence of the malignancy in bcg unresponsiveness when all the when the, there is a persistent of the tumor at 6 month so the, and bcg intolerance is when the side effects are there so why it is important to differentiate because in this cases of bcg refractory and bcg unresponsive tumors patient should be Uh, offered early cystectomy, and if they are not feeling that the, the the BCG should be replaced by some other intravesical chemotherapy, and patient should be told that there are a high chances of failure of such treatment. However, in cases of BCG relapsing tumor, there is a role of either reinduction of the BCG or uh, the second line of the intravesical chemotherapy also. Now, this is the strategy after BCG installation. So, whenever there is an bcg unresponsive tumor always offer the radical cystectomy when there is a late late bcg relapse you should always either offer the radical cystectomy or you should uh, see whether there is any uh, consider the individual after the age and comorbidity if there is a incomplete resection or no muscle invasive always offer a second trb and depending upon this low grade or high grade you should offer it so if it is a high grade lesion or muscle invasive lesion always offer radical cystectomy if it is a low grade tumor then you can either offer a repeat intravesical bcg for next 3 years regular follow up and depending upon this you can proceed further if there is a low grade tumor then again you have to see whether it's a macroscopically con- complete resection or incomplete resection if there is an incomplete resection you should go for the retrbt if there is a complete resection then depending upon the the pathology finding we can re- give a rechallenge of the bcg or we can give the consider the intravesical chemotherapy if there is a muscle invasive tumor we should always offer the radical cystectomy so now these are the treatment options bcg responsiveness radical cystectomy late bcg response uh, relapse offer radical cystectomy first if patient is not willing then we can offer as repeat bcg if the these relapse is happening late then we can offer the bladder preserving strategies also now that 
treatment strategy in primary or recurrent tumor without previous bcg so we have done the trbt after the trbt see what is the if it is a low risk tumor a small papillary tumor recurrence no perforation no extensive resection offer a single dose of chemotherapy if it is an apparently high high risk tumor muscle invasive tumor or early recurrence bladder perforation do not offer this uh, intravesical chemotherapy <clears throat> Now, if there is an incomplete resection or no muscle, always offer a second TRBT. If there is a macroscopically complete resection, TA with muscle in this specimen or low grade even without muscle, these patients should be stratified as per the age group and should be treated according to the guideline. If there is a muscle invasive tumor, always offer the radical cystectomy to this patient. So, this is the, so if it is a low risk tumor, Offer the single uh, dose of intravesical chemotherapy. Keep the patient in the regular follow-up. And depending upon the recurrence, if it's a tiny recurrence, just treat it, resect it, and consider the patient for the continuation of the treatment. If it's a large recurrence, always do a repeat TRBT and treat the patient according to the finding. If it's an intermediate risk group patients, patient has two options. Either patient can be offered a uh, intravesical chemotherapy for one year or patient can be offered DCG induction followed by maintenance for minimum of one year. If it is a high risk patient, patient should always intravesical DCG for minimum of one year but ideally should be for three years. Now, usually as we have seen that whenever there is a non-muscle invasive bladder tumor, we should always try to do a bladder preservation protocol if the patient is a good candidate for that. And But there are certain conditions when we should offer a, a radical cystectomy, non-muscle invasive bladder tumor also. So, they are the, if the tumor burden is more, if it is an unresectable site like diverticular tumor, if it's a BCG failure or unresponsive, there are instances when we have done the cystectomy in cases where the patient was having no malignancy but the bladder has become a thimble bladder after the BCG installation and the patient was having very low functional bladder capacity and patient was having extremely bothersome storage large frequency urgency and in those conditions also cystectomy has been offered and if the patient is not fit for intravesical drug installation like because of a stricture a small capacity bell bladder or total urinary incontinence and in presence of micropapillary variant also patient should be offered uh, radical cystectomy despite the fact that there is no muscle invasion now, these are the guidelines, how to do the record the depth of the invasion, margins, lymphovascular invasion, carcinoma in C2 and also. So, these are again EU and ESMO guidelines. So, what are the prognosticating markers? So, it is the tumor stage, concomitant, presence of concomitant CIS, tumor located at the bladder neck or trigone, prostatic urethral involvement, number of positive lymph nodes, number of lymph nodes removed, lymph node density, <coughs> ratio of positive lymph nodes and extranodal extensions are the <coughs> worst prognostic factors. There are certain molecular markers also like luminal malignancies are having a better prognosis rather than the basal malignancies. There are other tumor markers also like tumor mutation burden, PDL1, CD8 expression also. So these are the, again the guidelines for the new adjuvant. So new adjuvant chemotherapy should be offered uh, is having an improvement on the overall survival of by 5 to 8 percent. No adjuvant chemotherapy should be offered in all patients who are having disease beyond T2. However, in T1 disease and high grade early cystectomy patient, new adjuvant chemotherapy can be avoided. Currently, uh, all the all the studies have been done with the MVEC chemotherapy and but usually most of the centers new adjuvant chemotherapy is being given in the form of gemcitabine and cisplatin however it has been said that in cases of those patients who are cisplatin eligible should where the cisplatin should not be replaced by carboplatin and in those condition there are few studies are coming up where the pembrolizumab can also be tried so if eligible if eligible for cisplatin based chemotherapy always new adjuvant chemotherapy should be offered from t2 onwards and do nac should not be offered on those patients who are cisplatin ineligible and there is in those patients who are cisplatin ineligible can be offered new adjuvant chemotherapy immunotherapy also so what about the preoperative or new adjuvant radiotherapy usually it should not be offered 
do radiotherapy should not be offered for operable muscle invasive bladder cancers and radiotherapy should not be offered uh, when uh, <coughs> there is a urinary uh, diversion especially the ONB should be planned and RT should be offered in adjuvant setting only in cases of when there is a residual disease or macroscopic or margin positive disease. So now radical cystectomy is the gold standard for muscle invasive tumor. So the about the timing. The delay in more than three months has a negative impact. It can be defined as early in cases of T1 high grade, delayed and salvage. Salvage should be done when there is a recurrence of the tumor after uh, definitive primary treatment. Palliative should be considered when there is an it is being done for the purpose of uh, resolution of the symptoms. Indications are like from T2 onwards, no metastatic disease, BCG refracting, relapsing, unresponsive, extensive papillary tumor and an NMIBC with micropapillary variant. So what are the things to be removed? In radical cystectomy male, we remove bladder, prostate, seminal vesicle, distal ureter and regional lymph nodes. There are few sexual preserving techniques are available where we can uh, preserve prostate, capsule, seminal vesicle and nerve sparing. But these all are uh, on investigative purpose and there is no indication or recommendation for doing such surgery and, uh, unless it's exceptionally required. Now, radical cystectomy in women, it requires removal of adjacent entire urethra, vagina, uterus, distal ureter. Again, there are certain pelvic organ preservation techniques available, but they should be offered in selected cases only. So, the lymphadenectomy. So, the lymph node, uh, presence of lymph node invasion is a very important marker uh, for the outcome. And uh, there are three types of lymph nodes. The standard lymph nodes incl includes uh, lymph node uh, the, the lymph node dissection up to into the true pelvis, which includes hypogastric, iliac, interna iliac, external iliac, and obturator fossa. The extended lymph nodes includes standard along with the up to the uh, pel uh, the common iliac bifurcation, and the lateral border is up to the genitofemoral nerve. Extended lymph node uh, dissection is the standard of care nowadays. There are few conditions, there are few centers in uh, Korea and Japan where they are doing a super extended also, where the extent of the cranial extension go up to the inferior mesenteric artery, but there they have find that there is no added advantage in survival and recurrence, so it should not be offered unless there is a gross disease is present. Now, there are various methods of doing radical cystectomy. The open radical cystectomy is gold standard. But nowadays with the advent of robot and laparoscopy, there are uh, debate that which is better. So it has been identified that robotic, uh, uh, that in long term there is no added advantage. But in the minimal invasive, radical cystectomy has an advantage of decreased blood loss, decreased wound complication and early recovery and ho less hospital stay. The complications rates are almost similar, positive surgical margin and other uh, oncological outcomes are also comparable but at high volume centers and where the cystectomies are done in a regular basis. The main risk factor for complication comparing may be tissue handling and ext ideally whenever we are comparing the minimal invasive approach there the uh, we should also consider the uh, the diversion also intracorporeally there are initially few studies where they have tried to compare the robotic cystectomy with the open cystectomy uh, and they found that the robotic cystectomy has inferior outcome but there the the diversion was done extracorporeally but when it has been done with the head to head intracorporeal cystectomy with diversion versus open cystectomy and diversion, it has been identified that definitely uh, minimal invasive approach has a relatively advantage over this. So now the urinary diversion, it can be abdominal diversion in the form of urethrocutaneostomy and ileal conduit or colony conduits. It can be urethral diversion in the form of pouches and neobladder, rectosigmoid diversions. So, usually contraindication of ONB whenever there is an invasive urethral tumor, uh, lymph node positivity, N2 and N3, positive margin at prostatic urethra and bladder neck, urinary sphincter insufficiency, if the patient is not willing for CIC, if there is a debilitating neurological or psychiatric illness, if there is a limited life expectancy, when there is a severe or impaired liver or renal function and age is more than 80. In these kind of patients, Usually, orthotopic neobladder should not be offered. 
However, non-invasive bladder cancer at prostatic urethra, age more than 70 and N1 disease are the relative contraindication for ONV. Now, the ureterocutaneous cuto uh, neostosmy should be offered only in cases it's the simple simplest form of cutaneous diversion but it is associated with more uh, ureteric complications and stomal complication and should be offered only in patients where there the limited life expectancy is there now, ileal conduit is the gold standard up to 48 percent patient has early complication including uti pyelonephritis and ureteroileal leakage and stenosis Main complications are usually stomal related complications and there are functional or morphological changes in upper tract after ileal conduit in 30% of cases and <coughs> patient has also developed chances of secondary stones but it is the easiest form of con uh, urinary diversion very easy to uh, manage and less follow up is required. Now the orthotopic new bladder Various segments can be used, ileum, jejunum, colon. Usually the best is ileum. Jejunum is not used because of the more uh, metabolic complications. Colonic segment should be avoided because of the high pressure compliance. There are more chances of having urinary incontinence and upper tract damage. Very rarely transverse colon and stomach can also be used when the patient is having CKD and the patient is having <coughs> high creatinine values. Usually, the emptying of the reservoir depend upon the abdominal straining, intestinal peristalsis, and sphincter relaxation. And occasionally, patient may require CIC also. So, the early and late morbidity is up to 22%. They are including diurnal incontinence, nocturnal incontinence, stenosis, metabolic disorder, vitamin B12 deficiency. There is no cancer specific survival difference between new bladder. However, it has been found with the new bladder, there are less chances of urethral recurrence. So there are specific complications with ONB, which is early and delayed incontinence in male. There is a hypercontinence in females because of the fall of the orthotopic new bladder to the posteriorly. Delayed or persistent nocturnal incontinence because of the uh, <coughs> because of the relaxation of the smooth sphincter during the deep sleep, loss of sensation of urge for urination which can lead to over distension of bladder and lead to spontaneous rupture, high PVR or excessive mucus requiring regular CIC, recurrent urosepsis, metabolic acidosis which is more common in ileal and colonic segments, metabolic alkalosis and dysuria immaturia syndrome which is found when the stomach is used, vitamin B12 deficiency, anemia, osteomalacia, early or delayed upper tract changes and secondary stone formation. So rare urinary divergence are continent cutaneous pouch but they are usually not offered very easily because of the less experience and more complications. So ureterointestinal anastomosis are done multiple methods by tunnel methods, ileal intussusception, tapered and they are basically done for the purpose of avoiding upper tract damage. So these are the recommendations which we have to do, when to do and when not to do, what are the things to be seen. So these are the criteria for T2 disease onwards. So cystoscopy, tumor resection, evaluation of urethra. If the findings are same, always offer chemotherapy, no role of radiation. Immunotherapy should be offered only in an experimental method. Radical cystectomy should be done. If patient require, if a patient is high risk, margin positivity, lymph node more lymph node positivity, extra nodal extension available always or if when the new adjuvant chemotherapy has not been given, consider such patients for adjuvant chemotherapy. Now there are bladder sparing treatment when the tumor burden is less, then in that condition patient can be offered TMT, trimodality treatment where the radical TRBT followed by radiation and chemotherapy can be offered. Usually TMT should not be offered in cases of multiple tumors when the tumor is involving the trigone, when there are upper tract changes and when the patient is young because there are more chances of failure. And this should be offered only in cases when the patient is unfit for cystectomy and refuses for this. EBRT alone should not be considered as a uh, TMT unless it is being combined with chemotherapy should not be offered. Now, chemotherapy, 
as I have told you, there are two indications, new adjuvant in cases of T2 onwards disease and in, in, in post-operative adjuvant chemo setting, it can be given to those cases where the lymph node positivity is more, extranodal extension is more or there is an early recurrence is there. So, adjuvant therapy, as I have told you, adjuvant therapy should be done given only in cases of extensive disease. And uh, it should, uh, in cases of platinum ineligible patients, a patient can be considered for adjuvant immunotherapy also. As such, so there is no role of adjuvant radiation therapy unless there is a gross residual disease or positive surgical margin. So, this is all. Thank you. Thank you so much. We can open and uh, answer all the questions in Q&A and chat box. Yes, sir. So there is no question. So what is Vired? Vired is a method of uh, explaining, uh, of defining the lesion on MRI. It is mainly done for the for predicting whether there is a muscle invasion or not, and uh, it is for the local staging. And uh, uh, it, the purpose of uh, using Vired is whether we can replace the second resection or not. But till the time, it is only on the experimental basis, and uh, a second resection or muscle invasion has to be uh, defined only on the basis of biopsy, not only on the basis of Vired. Recycle imaging and reporting and analyzing of the data. Who cannot hold the urine? What should be the function? There is a question where he is saying the patient cannot hold the urine. What should be done for the intravesical therapy? So these patients should not be, uh, should, will not be a good candidate for intravesical therapy. And in such patient, we should uh, try, to, uh, we should, uh, we should offer them some radical surgeries like early radical cystectomy. There is another question, what are the most common complications after starting BCG induction? So they are mainly in the form of storage symptoms like frequency and urgency and sometimes patients incontinence which are mainly managed symptomatically by anticholinergic methods and flu therapy. So there is another question where there is Somebody has asked about the personal experience on bladder preservation approaches. So I am not a great fan of bladder preservation approaches because especially in cases of uh, muscle invasive disease or high grade uh, lamina invasive disease where patient is being managed with BCG, there are very high chances of having uh, early failure and or discontinuation of the therapy and eventually it will lead to compromise the outcome. Because an early cystectomy has an outcome of 90 to 95 percent five-year survival. However, a delayed cystectomy after doing giving some bladder preservation protocol, the the cancer the, the outcome decreases to 60 to 70 percent. So there is a question on Covac BCG by Cipla. So basically, rather than going for 80 milligram or uh, 40 milligram, we should try to see what is the CFU values. And the CFE value should be between 1 to 19 into 10 raised to the power 8. So if it is 40, if that much CFU is available in 40 milligram, ideally 40 milligram should be given rather than giving 80 milligram because that will be overdosed and more chances of complication and dropout rates. So there is another question where somebody has asked persistent urine cytology positivity. So these are the key patients where the patient should be evaluated with either narrow band imaging and uh, uh, PD cystoscopy as well as evaluation of the upper tract to rule out any flat lesion 
which can be missed on CT scan and white light cystoscopy. Any other question? Navneet ji? Yes sir, just scroll down there are a few more questions. And there are a few questions in the Q&A section as well. That I have already answered. Yeah, if on PET scan pre-op there is a lymph node enlargement, pelvic node, what should be done? So these patients are considered as a locally advanced disease and these are the candidate for the new adjuvant chemotherapy. And after the new adjuvant chemotherapy, patients should be reassessed and offered radical cystectomy with extended pelvic lymph node dissection. And if the lymph node is up to N1, then even orthotopic new bladder can be offered. But if the lymph nodes are N2 or N3, most likely these are the patient which will require adjuvant chemotherapy or radiation and they should not be offered uh, when be orthotopic new bladder. Initially, there is a very good question what protocol for ofloxacin. Initially, there was concern that if we are giving BCG, ofloxacin should not be in or fluoroquinol should not be given because this can lead to uh, less effectivity of the BCG. But in long term, a uh, good amount of studies has been done and it has not been found that the using fluoroquinolones in the BCG, post BCG will going to affect the outcome or the effectivity of the BCG. So it can be very well safely given for two to three days. Now there is another question somebody has asked how to manage the BCG related complication. So usually they are, they are mainly storage LUTs in the form of frequency, urgency and urgent continence because of the intense inflammation and they can be very well managed by decreased fluid intake and some bladder relaxant. Um, uh, uh, and anti-inflammatory. Navneet ji, any other question? Uh, I hope you have taken the questions in the, from the chat. I, yeah, I think Saurabh, you answered most of it. Yes, yes. sir. Saurabh, most of it is answered? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Saurabh. Uh, it was very, very good. I learned a lot, actually. <laughs> Nicely, you approached. You know, that's a very systematic way of approaching it. Uh, it was very good. And I really know students are greatly benefited uh, with the way you put it up. Huh? Thank you very much. Heartfelt thanks on behalf of NB and uh, National Board students and myself. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Very beautifully you covered it and excellent evidence-based. Huh? Very, very nice. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Saurabh Vashisht, for the presentation. Thank you, and thank you very much, Professor Dr. Somashikha, for joining. And thank you, trainees and faculty members, for joining.